Alan Bennett said very wisely, I think, although he's embarrassed when, if, if I remind him of, of this, he says, oh, you don't want to write a novel or a play. You ought to write an article or a leaflet. And what is inherent in that reply was the idea that leaflets, which are a political act, are more powerful than fiction, and that journalism, which is a, a, an act dealing with fact, if it's done properly, is also uh, stronger than uh, fiction. So that's my kind of starting point, that I recognise the limitations of, uh, of fiction when I try to include my politics in it. And yet something obviously very powerful draws you primarily to fiction. Um, and I wonder, other than the capacity fiction allows you to to be playful and to kind of mm. exhibit that cavalier aspect of yourself, are, are there other, other things that fiction gives to you? Yeah, yeah. So once I decided, you know, I was too old to be a freelance journalist and that the, the cavalier part of me that wanted to tell lies uh, could come to the fore and write fiction, I didn't stop being a political person. I was never going to be one of those people that, that said, I put my politics into my fiction, but don't vote and don't go to demonstrations and don't you know, take part in a political life. I do take part in political life. But nevertheless, when I'm with my fiction, I'm still um, uh, a, a political person. The challenge that I had to work out was, what is it that fiction, I knew what fiction couldn't do, but what could fiction do in a different way um, uh, that, that journalism and political action couldn't do. And in a way, I think you've got the answer when you look at someone, uh, the quintessential political writer, quintessential political novelist, George Orwell. Now, you look at his journalism and his essays uh, are down out in London and Paris, homie to Catalonia. They are right on the nose, truthful, plain, simple sentences, no invention at all. The facts do all the talking. The experience and the observations is what lends the power. Now consider what are the two most politically strong uh, works of fiction in the 20th century, perhaps, both by George Orwell, and that's Animal Farm and um, 1984. The one, a fantasy set in a farmyard with no, uh, well, uh, there are human characters, but basically people, people by animals, if I can use that phrase. And the other one, a dystopian um, um, uh, journey into the future, as 1984 once was. and so. Even Orwell, the man that was the, the, uh, the master of um, factual writing, had to reinvent fiction and dislocate the reader um, in his fiction. Now, this is the difference. Um, journalism locates you in a real place. Fiction should dislocate you in an invented place. And I think that was, once I realized that, that was why all of the settings of my novels and, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and the traditions of storytelling that, that I employ are ones that dislocate rather than locate. Yeah, you, I'd be interested for you to talk a little bit more about the possibilities of dislocation. I've heard you talk too about the importance of disconcerting your readers. Uh, and I wonder if that in itself, that act of dislocation and disconcerting your readers is potentially a political act. See, I don't want to be too grand about this because, because if you start saying that it's a political act to write a fine bourgeois novel, which is what I hope that I do, but it, they they are bourgeois novels, um, then somehow or other you're you're pretending that you're shoulder to shoulder with people on the front line and you're not. Um, so I'm very reluctant to give you the answer that I know you want there. I, um, um, but. But where dislocation is concerned, I mean, I'll give you an example. My second novel, um, uh, I'm just about to get the title wrong, The Gift of Stones. That was occasioned by my father-in-law, who used to work um, uh, uh, at the, um, in Birmingham at, at the Austin motor car factory. And uh, there was a great tradition in Birmingham of motor car building. We were the, the city of a thousand trades, and if it wasn't made, if it if it came if it was made of metal from a from a, a colander to a teaspoon, then it was rummaged and built. This was the pr proud tradition of a fairly ugly, disregarded city, Birmingham. And then along comes the Japanese car, 
and British motor industry collapses. I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing here. It's a very sim it's a simple view of what, really what happened. Now, I could have written the novel set about that very subject, about the loss of community, the loss of the certainty of work. And it could have been set in the 1970s in Birmingham. But journalists were covering that and journalists were making a much better version of that than, than a novelist ever could. And so what I would needed to do was to dislocate the subject. And I realized that I could dislocate the subject by taking a similar occurrence, which was the end of the Stone Age and the beginning of the Bronze Age, which was a time when everyone would have said, oh, the, the stone, the stonemakers are going to be OK till the end of time because people will always want stone. And then along comes metal. People would, uh, in the 1970s, will say, we'll be OK in Birmingham because people always want our cars. And then they stop wanting their cars. So there was the dislocation for you. Now, that dislocation not only works for the reader, but it works for me because suddenly I'm freed up of my tub thumping political ideas, which are not nuanced at all, I have to tell you. And now I myself are back in the Stone Age, set, setting a novel there and Suddenly, I discovered that my political views, which are hardcore and unrelenting and Stalinist, are nuanced because that's the gift of fiction, whereas journalism needs to be uh, much more straightforward, much more puritanical, as I've said. So you're, the ambivalence and ambiguity that you can explore in fiction allows you to raise questions rather than Perhaps exactly, exactly. At the end of if, if we were to have a political discussion, I'd tell you what I think. Um, but if we were to if you if I'm going to write a novel on that same subject, what I want to do is is for the answers to start occurring to you rather than me telling you what the answers are. And so, I mean, you know, it sounds like I'm, be, I'm being all very wise and very cute, but it's not that's not what's happening at all. When I discovered fiction after I packed up being in journalism, this was the gift of fiction. Fiction is. This is, you know, my usual rant, but it's thousands of years old and and it's and it's learned all kinds of tricks. And if you think you can come along as a new writer and treat fiction to treat story, uh, storytelling as if it's your thing and, it, and teach it how to behave, then you're fooling yourself. What has been a joy for me as someone writing books is that is that fiction gives and gives and gives. And sometimes when you start writing a novel, it's like pushing a great heavy piece of gra granite up a hill. But very, very soon that granite, if fiction is on your side, if storytelling is on your side, starts to turn into a, a helium filled balloon. And then you're just hanging on to it and thanking God for the for the uh, the shaping of fiction that is thousands and thousands of years old and which you're just employing and borrowing and stealing from. I think on that note of the power of narrative, it's probably a, a good moment for us to pause and um, turn to a reading from Jim. Um, I've asked Jim to read from his 2013 novel, Harvest, uh, one of his novels that was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Um, one of the reasons why I asked Jim to read from Harvest is because I find it a, a really brilliant example of this idea of approaching political themes aslant. Um, so themes such as uh, isolationism and um, power dynamics and dispossession. In this case, in Harvest, we have a fictional unnamed village in an indeterminate uh, time period. Uh, could be medieval, could be Elizabethan, could be Tudor. Um, it's a time, though, when um, communal land is being enclosed. And I think uh, Jim has a, a map that he shared with us. The picture I want to show is a picture of Ridge and Furrow, which if you live in the Midlands and live in Worcestershire, the, the English Midlands, as I do, you can't you can hardly go for a walk without seeing the Ridge and Furrow of the, of the English countryside um, in the fields. When you see the Ridge and Furrow, what you're seeing is the last plough marks that were in those fields before the field was enclosed. And some of those plough marks um, from the communal agriculture of the me medieval times uh, can be four or five hundred years old. And when I've walked around them, I've often thought, well, these are absolutely beautiful landscape things. I, I just love encountering them, particularly when they're cross as it as it were. But also, not only are they beautiful, they are the ugly reminder of a dispossession. 
because the people that farmed their land in the strip system in those periods that you mentioned didn't want to lose their strips. Um, they wanted to hang on and be agricultural workers, but money made them um, move out and, and change their ways. It was outsiders that came in. You know, when I write a book, I need to triangulate it. I need sort of three or four things going on that bounce off each other. For me, the second thing was, was I went to an exhibition of, of British watercolours at the British Museum. And the first one, as soon as I walked through the open door, was a painting of um, the plans of enclosure and a closure system of somewhere in the East Midlands. And it was very, very beautiful. And here was an artist who'd been pulled in, pulled in by the landowner, the man that was seizing the land, to um, uh, represent uh, the changes, the beautiful changes in oil colour or in watercolour terms that were going to affect people's lives, but their actual ugly changes that were going to affect their livelihoods. So I, I felt that this was interesting, this conflict between beauty and dispossession. But I needed a modern political setting to make it work. And that wasn't hard to find because when I wrote this book in um, eight years ago, you didn't have to go far um, to hear on the news about um, uh, the soya barons in Brazil seizing forest and turning people off their land. You didn't have to go far to see the be suited entrepreneurs um, and venture capitalists in New Delhi who'd never left the city but were buying up land in southern India because they knew they could make a profit from it and they were turning off the farmers that might have been there for centuries. Um, or you might read about Nestle and its coffee camps in Ethiopia and its bad practices, or you might hear about palm oil magnets in Indonesia. So this was what was relevant for me. This dispossession of people from their lands was not something that belonged in the setting that I was going to place it. It was something that was on the news again and again and again, night after night. The section I'm going to read um, deals uh, with this small isolated village and uh, the, the rather effete artist that's going to draw and paint in watercolours the, the beautiful landscape and, and the, the re rearrangement of the, um, of the, of the village in, in, during the enclosures. It's called Philip Earl, but he's known as Mr Quill by all the locals because he carries a quill everywhere he goes, a quill pen. And we start off with the master of the village. Master Kent is standing now and drawing expectant smiles from us. These feasting times are when fueled by ale, he likes to recall for his soil bound guests the life he led before his happy coming here. His are embroidered tales of a strange and dangerous world, imps and oceans, palaces and wars. They always leave my neighbours glad they'll not be part of it. But tonight, his mood is clearly not a teasing one. Instead, he has invited Mr Quill to join him at the makeshift dining board, and both of them have clapped us quiet. Is this a moment we should fear? Here is my good acquaintance, Philip Earle, he says, taking hold of Mr Quill's elbow and pushing him forward for us to greet and inspect. You will have met him yesterday, and you will see him hereabouts for one more week. He has come to us in my employ to make a map of all our common ground and land. We will prepare some raw pauper's vellum for his task from that veal skin of hanging now above my head. He will take note of everything and then draw up petitions for the courts. What follows is, with your willing kind consents, an organisation to all of our advantages. Too many seasons have been hard for us. At this point, Mr. Earl, as we will never think of him, unrolls one of the working charts he has prepared and asks us to come up to see our world as it is viewed by kites and swifts and stars. We press forward, shuffling against each other to fit within the lantern light. These are more complete than yesterday, says Mr. Quill, but once again, we only see his geometrics and his squares. His mapping has reduced us to a web of lines. There is no life in them. Now he shows a second chart with other spaces. This is your hereafter, he says. 
Yes, our tomorrows will be shaped like this, adds Master Kent. That yes is more uncertain than it ought to be. He pauses, smiles. I will be exact, he promises, but not it seems for the moment. Say it, say it, say it now, say the word, I urge him silently. I don't have to be a swift or kite to know about the world and how it's changing, changing shape, as Master Kate Kent suggests, and to hear the far off bleating of incoming animals that are neither cows nor pigs nor goats that are not brethren. I know at once I feared this, yes, ever since the mistress died. The organization to all of our advantages that the master has in mind against his usual character and sympathies, against his promises, involves the closing and the engrossment of our fields with walls and hedges, ditches and gates. He means to throw a halter around our lives. He means the clearing of our common land. He means the cutting down of trees. He means this village far from everywhere, which has always been a place for horn, corn and trotter and little else, is destined to become a provisioner of wool. The word that he and no one dares to whisper, let alone cry out, is sheep. Instead, Master Kent presents a little nervously a dream he's had. He hopes that if he can describe these changes as having been fetched to him by a dream, then we will understand him more and fear him less. For dreams are common currency, even amongst commoners. Surely we are dreamers too. In this dream, all his friends and neighbours, meaning us, no longer need to labour long and hard throughout the year and with no certainty that what we sow will ever come to grain. We have good years, we have bad, he reminds us. We share contentments, but we also share the suffering. The sun is not reliable, and nor is rain. A squalling wind can flatten all our crops. Mildew reduces it to mush. Our cattle might be ravaged by the moraine fever. Our harvest can be taken off by crows. But wool is more predictable. A fleece of wool does not require the sun. Indeed, a fleece of wool will grow and thicken in the dark. A fleece is not affected by the wind or by the changing seasons, he says, warming to the task, for it is a task, a labour of persuasion. And as far as he's aware, crows do not have a taste for wool. Despite, he smiles to alert us for his coming jest, their appetite for flocking. No, Master Kent has had a dream which makes us rich and leisurely. Every day becomes a day of rest for us. We walk about our fenced-in fields with crooks. We sit on tussocks and we merely watch. We are not ploughing, we are shepherding. We are not reaping, we are shearing. We are not freezing to the bone on damp and heavy winter days, picking stones out of the soil, wringing the necks of furrow weeds, or tugging out twine roots and cooch until our backs are stiffer than a yoke. No, we are sitting at our fires at home and weaving fortunes for ourselves from yarn. Our only industry is shooting shuffles to and fro as if it were a game, a child's play. Our only toil is easy toil, a gentle firming at the heddles, attending to the warp and weft with just our fingertips, untying snags and loosening. Instead of oxen, there will be looms. Instead of praying for the stems of crops to stay, to, to stay straight and tall, against the odds, against the efforts of the elements, and for their ears of corn to thicken and to ripen, we will be closing the sheds on broadcloth, fusting, worsted and twill. A stirring prospect, isn't it, he says, somewhere too far away to name, in places we can never see. A man is putting on a coat that we have shepherded, and then made up with our own hands. A woman pulls a scarf across her head, and smells our, our herb, hearths and country odours in its weave. We start off with the oily wool on the back of our own livestock, our gold, golden hoofs, and end up with garments on the back of noble folk. It is a dream that surely none of us finds vile. And still, he has not said it. Sheep. Am I the only one to recognise what the dream is trying to disguise? The sheaf is giving way to sheep.
Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. It was really lovely to hear the word spoken in your voice, because I think one of the things that I've always found so compelling about your writing is the, the melody um, and the lyricism of your work. So I was very intrigued um, in your uh, Radio 4 Book Club interview back in 2013, you talked about the influence of uh, political novelists uh, like Orwell, uh, like Steinbeck, um, mm. and your own perhaps surprise when you discovered that your own writing voice was a, a rhythmic, uh, lyrical voice. Mm. And you seem to be suggesting in that interview that it that therefore precluded you from being a political writer. And I just was interested to hear you explore a little bit more the relationship between political themes and this kind of lyrical voice that you you write it. Well, when I when I first started to write write fiction, I failed with a straight in your face political novel, and I and I failed after about three chapters. So this, you know, it's it's in my archive in Texas. It's just not worth looking at. It didn't work. And the reason was I was singing in. I, I wasn't a journalist any longer. I couldn't use my journalistic voice. I had to find a be a different voice, and I was trying to sing in a different voice to my own natural one. I was I was singing baritone instead of soprano or, or whatever. If it, you're a lucky writer if you discover your voice. And pretty soon I discovered that my voice was not a, a very contemporary one. It was actually a very, a, a very um, uh, old fashioned traditionalist verse, uh, voice, that it was a storyteller's voice. It was more of a voice that you would hear around the fire as people were t uh, telling stories out loud um, rather than um, a voice which was, uh, was intimate and muttering. And so that's just the hand I've been dealt. Now, I could have um, been a bit more principled and stuck to my political instincts, but I would never have been published because I couldn't do that unnatural voice, that political voice convincingly. And so I think that, that that's what I do. I feel as if I'm, uh, I've got people in the room when I'm writing and that you have to employ all of the tricks of language to keep people's um, attention. Now, I've been to uh, um, traditional storytellings and, and also, you know, uh, British uh, in the in the British storytelling um, uh, revival here in the in the 1970s. I went to a lot of uh, of um, out loud storytelling events, and um, the good ones are the ones that that change the the, the um, length of the sentences. They're the one that recognises the natural cadence in the English language, which isn't um, a pentameter, but it's iambic. Um, and I employ those with such um, uh, thrumming intensity that one critic, um, Adam Mars Jones, said that to read a single paragraph of a Jim Crace novel is to invite a migraine. Um, so if any of the people listening in this afternoon uh, go to tea to, this evening with a migraine, they, they know who to blame. It's, um, it's rhythmic language. But I just want to employ all of those things. I am. I, um, I put in the balance, every single word that I put in any sentence is balanced and measured and weighed. Um, and if there's a syllable too many, I take it out. And it, it's a bit obsessive, but it is what I do. And is there a way in which that can offer up possibilities for exploring political themes? No, you know, I mean, I know that I always <laughs> say they can, but no, it isn't. It, I, I'm very, very conscious that somehow or other, that even though I'm, I'm, I still want to stay in the ring, ring um, flailing around and throwing and throwing punches, that that my voice is not as um, as engaged. Um, this storytelling voice is not as cannot be and is not as politically engaged as my journalistic voice, um, and and it's powerful. In, it might be powerful, but be powerful in different ways. I mean, I'll give an example. Recently, I did uh, a couple of years back. I did. Um, I was the judge for the Folio Prize, and um, this was a prize which is um, in which fine writing is given uh, the reward. So you you can't just be powerful writing; it has to be fine writing. But actually, it's open to um, uh, novelists, and it's open to autobiography, and it's open to poets. So any kind of writing can um, can can make the shortlist. Now, on our shortlist, we had some very, very strong novels um, which dealt with extreme um, uh, human encounters and with death and all such things. And they were very moving. But the fifth one and the one that went on to win 
was was a book called I have it here right here it's called the there we are it's called the ghost of the Su tsunami um by a journalist called Richard Lloyd Parry and it's about the Japanese tsunami now the emotion that I got about the that that I took from those novels which were first class novels they made the shortlist of you know this this prize um were 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 filtrated somehow because they were invented the people that died or the people that were injured or the people who were dispossessed never existed. They were figments of the um, of the writer's imagination, maybe based on truth, but they were still fictional. Whereas the the upset that I felt when I read The Ghost of Tsunami was because everybody that died was a real person. Everyone that named existed. Everyone described looked like that. The grief that was felt by the mothers was real grief about real children that died just a couple of years ago. And to some extent, I think I'm making the same point I made earlier on to some extent that I would be I don't want to fool myself and think that I can uh, I can bring about a greater level of emotion than the true facts of the real world can. That's why the three writers on the um, on the uh, creative writers on, on, on the judging panel unanimously chose the ghost of the tsunami because it was a, rec a recognition of the limits limitations of fiction. And what I think is, in my uh, um, trying to persuade myself, I guess, what, what I think is that if you recognise the limitation of fiction, it is that point that you start pushing your shoulders against doors which look closed and try and come up with alternative ways to deal um, uh, with politics in your fiction, if politics is what is your passion is about. So in my case, I refuse to think that I'm a player in politics simply because I write novels that have got a political aspect to them. But on the other side, I persuade myself that if you do share my views, then there are subtleties and nuances that you can get from fiction that you're not going to get from that leaflet I mentioned earlier, or that banner, uh, or that slogan. I'm really relieved <laughs> that we've ended on a, a, a positive um, affirmation of the power I hope of I'm <laughs> no absolutely not but i was um i was desperately thinking how i could try to turn it around there with um, <laughs> what, what fiction can have offer but you've done it absolutely perfectly it's just down to me really to to thank you for thank you, raising lots of possibilities and raising lots of questions uh, in your interview as well as of course in your fiction